Hello, everybody. Um, so what I want to do in this lecture, um, so first of all, actually, hello from Guatemala. I apologize about trying to get together on technology and not having the ability to, to do that live. Um, I really wanted to be able to touch base. So we'll work with what we can and do the best we can. Um, so you should have uh, completed your uh, first assignment, but it will be uh, definitely due by the 21st. Um, so don't procrastinate um, because you have another assignment this week and we're moving pretty fast. This is summer and we have uh, quite a bit to do um, in a very short amount of time. Um, so your city training is around ethics, um, dealing with the first two weeks of class. Your next assignment is your ICPSR data assignment, and that's worth 25% of your grade. The whole assignment, the complete assignment, will be due May 30th, but you have components of it, pieces of it, that will be due as we move along um, these weeks. So, for example, at the end of this week, you do have the first questions as stated on the syllabus due, and that will be um, graded as part of your quizzes and Blackboard discussions. Um, so um, so these smaller pieces of the assignments are going to be part of your um, grade under quizzes and Blackboard discussion. And the whole assignment will be graded um, as one piece, um, and that will be due May 30th. You also have this qualitative group project, so you should begin thinking about what you might want to do. Um, think of some ideas. We'll do some brainstorming during class, um, and you'll be able to, and I'll break you up into your groups then. So you can begin thinking about that, and you have two options. You'll either be able to um, choose a topic of your own, or I can give you some qualitative data um, to work with if you don't want to do your own data collection. And there'll be sort of equity based on the number of interviews you'll be analyzing if I give you data versus you collecting your own data. And then you have a, um, a final presentation of that qualitative project, and of course your attendance and um, engagement will be due, uh, will be part of your uh, grade as well. Um, and then these quizzes and Blackboard discussions, so anytime we do something online, those will be graded and you will be, you will be expected to post on Blackboard um, discussions if there's something um, that we're doing online. Okay? So what for today, the reading was done with evidence to inform practice, and that's what I wanted to talk a bit about today. Um, basically, this really comes from this underlying belief that when you're working with people um, with emotional behavioral challenges, that people deserve and should be receiving the best care that meets their needs, and that's based on the best scientific knowledge available. Um, and also based on this fundamental concern that for many of these individuals, um, that care can be delivered that's not necessarily effective care. We make assumptions about what is effective or not as effective. Do we know if our services or what we're providing for clients really work? So just this underlying belief that it's an ethical issue and concern that people should be receiving, should be able to receive the best care that meets their needs and that's best on, based on the best information and knowledge that we have available at this time. So in terms of defining evidence-based practice, um, there's a lot of variation in definitions. Um, but basically, these, um, this concept really comes from the medical field. And um, it's the idea that you're using the best available evidence to guide your decisions about care, um, combined also, though, with the experience of a physician in the clinical setting. And so translate that to you know, the experience of a clinician, of a social worker, as well as the patient's beliefs as, and experiences. So translated into social work, um, it's also defined as any practice that's established as effective through scientific research according to some set of criteria. But you'll see as we move forward in terms of this um, conversation that that first definition is really the one that's utilized most. Um, that's the idea about, yes, using evidence to guide care, um, but you also really combine that with what the client wants, um, with the particular context of your practice and your own clinical experience. Um, so the idea is that you have some sort of standard, um, standardized 
treating it, right? Some things that are common across clients or cases that you would do. So for example, if you're using motivational interviewing, which is an evidence-based practice, there's certain um, protocols within that approach that you would use consistently in all of your cases. Also the idea that you're going to evaluate your own practice and evaluate the outcomes with clients. Um, and, um, and in sort of the best case scenario or the ideal world, we would actually be able to do controlled trials. That doesn't always happen. That's much more common in medicine. That's not necessarily um, in the uh, mental health fields what we're able to do, but we're certainly able to use a lot of tools to evaluate our own practice. Um, so the other piece of this is thinking about how you evaluate um, the research and the things that you consume, right? So we're not always researchers as practitioners, but we're consumers of research, and we need to think about the studies that we use for our practice. So part of what you learn in these research classes is how to evaluate the rigor, the scientific rigor, right? So you would look at the study design, if you're looking at a quantitative study, you might look at how many cases they had. You would consider, you would read this um, work and think about, is this transportable? Is this something I can use in my context? Um, have they accounted for a variety of variables? Um, do the characteristics of treatment um, fit with your population? So that's one of the uh, issues with evidence-based practice is that um, a lot of times um, it's not culturally based, or, um, or you have to make some adaptations um, and think about your own, um, the own, your own group. Um, and you also have to think about um, co-occurring disorders, other, just other contextual issues. Um, if you're working with children, is this developmentally appropriate? Has this been used with this particular age group? Okay, and then I mentioned the issue of cultural sensitivity. Um, so as I said before, the current definition that's much more common within social work is this idea that blends the best evidence, client preferences, and clinical expertise. Um, so it's this process by which you begin with converting the need into, um, for information into an answerable question. So you, um, so you think about how, um, what is the information that you need to gather? How can you phrase this into a question that will guide your literature search? Um, when you search for the best evidence um, to deal with that particular issue. And then you do your search, right? You do your library search um, or searching different evidence-based websites to try to find the best answer to that question and that process of critically appraising the evidence and then integrating that evidence with your own experience and with the client's um, needs and wants and goals. Um, and then you evaluate the effectiveness of your practice and repeat these steps. So this is um, different models of asking questions. The one that we would um, that we would probably use most would be this Coates question. Um, the question needs to be client oriented, practical, and guide your search for evidence. Um, so at the bottom of this slide, you see that it says Coates form of asking questions. So you consider your client type. So for example, I'm working with students who are at risk of dropping out and you mention your course of action. So that might be um, these students receive mentoring compared, and then your alternative course of action compared to students who do not receive mentoring. Um, so, and what you intend to accomplish. So um, you would say something like, um, you know, will students who receive individual mentoring compared to students who, um, who do, who only receive regular um, guidance counseling, for example, um, will have lower dropout rates. Um, or so, so you would. So that's those are the different pieces of that question, and that's how you would turn it into a an evidence-based question. So, thinking about what's your specific client type, what is your course of action, what is your alternative course of action, and what you intend to accomplish. Um, so some of the problems um, or pitfalls with building a Coates question is asking questions that are irrelevant to the client. So make sure that fits the question you're asking fits with the goal of the client. And that's also an intervention that the client can afford. 
you um, don't want to ask questions that are too vague. So be specific, right? I wouldn't want to say that the um, youth who receive mentoring are going to do better in school. Well, what does that really mean? So be specific. Um, we'll have lower dropout rates. We'll increase their GPA. You know, think about well, how it is that you're measuring um, the outcome. Um, or you might ask incomplete questions, so not think about what is the alternative action. Um, you might incorrectly label the problem, procedure, or outcome. Um, so again, think clearly about what the problem is, what you're going to do actually, and what the outcome is. Um, and you want to try to avoid asking two or more questions within one question. So again, some of the, some of the challenges, um, the best questions are a lot of times written collaboratively. So ideally, you might be working with a team where you'd want people, uh, others to participate in that process. Um, maybe you're not sure what sources to use. Um, thinking about how do you consider context? Um, what if you're doing you're looking at evidence and all of the, the approach that you want to use has only been used with sort of mainstream middle class populations, but you're working with a predominantly Latino immigrant community. How will you translate this into the needs of that particular community? Um, and the need to be flexible and be able to adapt um, your, uh, your, your intervention. Um, and then again, the, the biggest issue is support. So a lot of times people might choose or know of an evidence-based question, but not have um, the, pro the appropriate access to train in that particular methodology or approach. Um, so those are the sort of pitfalls. This is just an example so that you have an example of a COPE's question. Um, so Dr. Carla Lopez, um, and this was actually a real case, just pseudonyms are used here. Um, she designated the um, pupil personnel services team to work on the issue of dropouts. Um, and so here's the question that was developed as a team of students deemed at risk of dropping out of high school. So that's the specific population are given a specific school-based dropout intervention program. So that's what you're going to do. They're going to participate in this program. Or the standard school-based intervention, so the regular um, counseling and academic advising with nothing special. Will the school-based dropout program produce better outcomes, helping youth stay in school and graduate on time? Um, here's another example of a COPE's question. Um, if students are at risk of dropping out in the third tier of intervention, so third tier in school context means micro level, if they're given an intensive school-based treatment or the standard individual counseling, which approach will be more likely to increase the likelihood of students staying in school? So this just gives you a sense for how you incorporate those pieces into a question. And it also then gives you a sense of what you're going to search for. So you're going to search for keywords like school dropout prevention programs, school interventions, social work, and dropout prevention, those kinds of things. So this question will guide how you do your search, your literature search. Um, and then you select and make a decision about what you're going to implement. Now the article that you had in class, Nevo and Son and Nevo, um, talks about evidence-informed practice and they really emphasize the flaws with um, the very um, kind of rigid approach, right? The approach that's too mechanistic, that ignores flaws in research. Um, um, so the, the, the issue of, um, that we talked about with um, sometimes um, the difficulty in implementing um, a particular uh, evidence-based approach due to contextual constraints or population or differences in your context or training um, that would make it um, difficult to implement this approach. Um, and the fact that empirical findings can really become outdated quickly, so it typically takes two to three years to publish an article, so by the time the findings are published, maybe there's new information out there that's more updated. Um, so it can really be difficult to um, keep up with, um, you know, current, kind of the most current literature, even if you're using sort of peer-reviewed journals because of the, the time gap between the time something is um, the study is done and um, and when the outcome is finally published. Um, and, and so they prefer, um, and they talk about how practice is very much of an art, so that's very important, and they don't believe that the evidence-based should um, 
take precedence over sort of the art of social work practice or the client concerns. And they really view using empirical evidence um, or research, right, as only a part of the process. And I think most people would probably agree with that. I don't think, I think the tone of the article sounds like this is sort of this big controversy when in reality I think most people would really pretty much agree with their perspective. And so they prefer the use of the terminology evidence-informed practice rather than evidence-based practice um, because they say that the use of the word informed um, really allows for um, evidence to, in their words, enrich practice and not constrain practice. Um, and again, they really emphasize that it should be client-centered um, and that clinicians should really be, or social workers or practitioners should be knowledgeable about research findings from all types of studies and be able to use them in an integrated manner. Okay, so I'm going to pause the recording for a bit. Um,